All right, hello and welcome to the 10th of many live stream noon conferences hosted by MRI Online. In response to the changes happening around the world right now and the shutting down of in-person events, we have decided to provide free daily noon conferences to all radiologists worldwide. Today we are joined by Dr. Suresh Mukherjee. He is a recognized authority in head and neck and neuroradiology. He has authored over 400 scientific manuscripts and book chapters and written or edited 12 textbooks. He's a consulting editor to both neuroimaging clinics and magnetic re resonance clinics of North America. He is a devoted educator and has been invited speaker on over 400 occasions. Just a reminder that there will be time at the end of this hour for a Q&A session. Please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions and we will get to as many as we can before our time is up. That being said, thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. McCurgy. I will let you take it from here. Great, thank you very much. Well, again, thank you for everyone um, that have joined this. Um, you know, first of all, I want to thank MR Online for putting this together. Um, it's a uh, unusual times we're going through right now. And, and first of all, after I say thank you, I also want to hope everyone is safe and healthy. Um, times that I was born in the last century, I trained in the last century, but um, uh, I've never seen any times like this. And it became a little bit closer home. One of my colleagues, mother who was very healthy yesterday, um, all of a sudden came down with COVID and, and is now um, on the brink of renal failure um, besides arts and is on a respirator. So um, this is a real disease, unfortunately. And with that, uh, again, I applaud MR Online for providing really a global community service. I think there are people from all over the world. Um, I've, got, uh, I've already got some nice uh, WhatsApps and WeChats from my colleagues around the world. So, um, you know, in this time, uh, we're supposed to be alone, but uh, it's also nice to be alone together. And I think this type of forum um, helps us communicate with each other and uh, um, work with each other to realize that we're all sort of facing the same crisis, but, you know, we will get through it together as well too. Um, just other, two other things, <clears throat> requests. Um, if you can just send like a email, maybe it'll be fun from, a, I think on your ability to, to put a little um, uh, chat box in is just say where you're from and just share it from all over the world. I've always been amazed at the power of uh, the internet. And so I, I know I would love to see where you're from. I think we're already up to, I think 764 participants. And so I'd love to see uh, where you're from. Um, and also, if you are watching it with more than one person, um, just to see how many people are actually in groups together and, and how many people are actually touching. So um, if you could um, embellish me with that, I would, uh, I'd, certainly, uh, I'd certainly appreciate it. So what we'll do in the next um, 45 minutes or so is talk about the spaces of the head and neck. And um, despite what many of the Residents may think the spaces of the head and neck were not created just to torture you on your training exams. Um, I know that's a common myth, but it's not. But in fact, the spaces of the head and neck have been around for over 230 years. Some would say even longer than that. And the spaces of the head and neck were first described by these incredible French anatomists. And so what we're going to do is that we're going to go over the spaces of the head and neck. Now, I'm a head and neck radiologist. and you know, I'm not the smartest person in the world. I'm sort of like a Fred Flintstone radiologist. So I'm not going to talk a lot about CTology or, or, or MRIology or petology or anything like that. One premise if, if that I've always adhered to in the last, you know, 50, 60, 70 years that I've been doing this is the purpose of imaging is to show the anatomy. And the best way to look, if you understand the anatomy, then you can understand head and neck radiology. Um, if you start adjusting your protocols to some of these newer sequences and the newer techniques, and that prevents you from seeing the anatomy, well, sometimes it is one step forward and two steps back. But really, the key to this is to really, it's all about anatomy. So what I'm going to do is talk about the various spaces of the head and neck, and I've listed them there, and hopefully make it a little bit simple and uh, make it a little bit easier because for me, head and neck is super exciting. Um, you know, we have a worldwide audience and I want all of you to become head and neck radiologists. That's my ultimate goal. But what I hope to do at the end of this lecture is at the very least um, demystify it and make it a little bit easier for you. So you're not going to be um, scared of looking at the various spaces of the head and neck. And the first space that we'll talk about 
is the masticator space. Now, I don't know about where you went to medical school. Where I went to medical school, we did have a gross anatomy class. And, you know, we would spend um, like two months on the liver and two months on the leg and, um, you know, two months on the, you know, fill in the blank. But when it came to the head and neck, we barely spent maybe two weeks on the head and neck. And then all of a sudden, as radiologists, and we see something in the neck, we have this daunting task about trying to not only understand the, uh, the normal, but also understand the abnormal. So what I'm going to first start about is the masticator space. And pure and simply, the masticator space and the muscles of mastication. So in order to understand the masticator space, we have to see that this muscle right here that I'm contouring is the masseter muscle. This muscle here is actually the medial pterygoid muscle, not the superior, not the lateral, but the medial. Here's a temporalis muscle, and here is the lateral pterygoid muscle. So the most, the largest component of the masticator space is the muscles of mastication. The next component that I'm going to contour, and it's a little hard to see, is there's a little oval-shaped structure right here that drops down below foramen ovale, and that's the third division of the fifth cranial nerve. And the last component of the masticator space is the bone. So if I had to contour the masticator space on the right-hand side, this would be my contour, which would include the muscles, it would include the bones, and it would include this little oval-shaped structure here, uh, which is the third division of the fifth cranial nerve. So the components of the masticator space are muscle, bone, and nerve, with the largest component being the muscle. And on the coronal images, if I had to contour the masticator space, I would come down like here, come all the way up and all the way up there. So if we just looked at a patient that had a mass involving the masticator space and knowing that the muscle is the largest component, if I was to tell you that there was a 14-year-old boy that had a mass in the masticator space, the most likely diagnosis is what? It's probably going to be a rhabdomyosarcoma. Why? Because muscle is the most largest component of the masticator space and the most common soft tissue sarcoma in a child is going to be a rhabdomyosarcoma. So just realize that the anatomically based differential diagnosis of a masticator space mass is very easily going to be a muscle, it's going to be a bone, and then it's going to be a nerve. Now, if you take that same approach and you move away from the head and neck, and so let's say you go to an accessory organ like um, the leg, right? I know I have a lot of colleagues that are musculoskeletal radiologists, but for me, it's all an accessory organ to the neck. But let's just say someone asks you to give a differential diagnosis of a mass involving the thigh. Well, very easily, you can pivot to a differential diagnosis involving the muscle. So you can talk about leiomyomas, leiomyosarcomas, rhabdomyomas, rhabdomyosarcomas, um, synovial cell sarcomas, so on and so forth. And you can also talk about the bones, right? So you can talk about metastases and myelomas and the various sarcomas that arise from the bone. And then you can always talk about the nerves. So the nerves include things like uh, schwannomas, neurofibromas, et cetera. So my point is, is that it's the same type of tissue that's in the neck, but when it occurs in the neck or the spaces, we tend to have palpitations and get nervous. All I'm asking you is that when you now look at the head and neck, and especially in the masticator space, you don't necessarily need to think the neck, but just step back and say, well, what are the differential diagnoses for lesions that involve the muscle, the bone, and the nerve? And if you take that approach, then you'll be able to come up with a pretty sophisticated diagnosis involving the masticator space. So here's an example of a mass involved in the masticator space. Now, how do I know it's in the masticator space? Well, normal or abnormal, it's obviously abnormal, and I draw a line down the middle. Now, we can see the mass here on the left-hand side, but notice what it's doing to the parapharyngeal space. It's effacing the parapharyngeal space. It's not involving it. And so if we see this, then we know the mass is involved in the masticator space. So what's the most common comp component of the masticator space? It's muscle. And the next thing you have to do is you have to ask the age. So this is an elderly male, like myself, unfortunately. So the most likely diagnosed in this case was, in fact, a leiomyosarcoma. Here's another patient. Here's another mass involved in the masticator space. We can see it right here. But in this case, this was a child. And this was a 14-year-old child that had a mass in the masticator space. Most like, the largest component of the masticator space is muscle. 
This is involving the soft tissues. So this in fact was a rhabdomyosarcoma. Here's another lesion. These are these crazy jaw lesions that you always have to worry about. But again, if you sometimes, if you don't think head and neck and you think other areas, you could easily make the diagnosis that this bony excrescence here is an osteoma. And this person right here, this lesion right here is one of those crazy jaw lesions. And this in fact is an ameloblastoma. So this is one of those head and neck lesions. But again, you can come up with a relatively sophisticated diagnosis by remembering muscle, bone, and then we always have to remember the nerve. So this was a patient that had a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Here's the, here's the lateral pterygoid muscle, and we can see this mass right here. Remember, V3 is just medial to the lateral pterygoid muscle. So because this muscle is displaced medially, as is seen here, and we see this rounded lesion, then we know that this is arising from the nerve, and this happens to be perineural spread of tumor from nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And this lesion, another lesion here, again, it's involved in the masticator space. Why? Because look what it's doing to the lateral pterygoid muscle. It's displacing it laterally. And when we look at the coronal images, we can see this mass extending superiorly through foramen ovale. And again, this was a schwannoma involving B3 extending into the foramen ovale. So when we talk about the masticator space, and again, if you're taking notes, this is what I would suggest writing down is muscle, bone, and nerve. And if you remember muscle, bone, and nerve for the masticator space, you'll be able to come up with a pretty sophisticated differential diagnosis. So the next space that we'll go on to is the visceral space. Now, the, I don't like to memorize. I'm a <clears throat> terrible memorizer. So, but here's one thing that you have to remember when we talk about these spaces of the head and neck. And, and that is the fascia of the head and neck. Now, I would assume the majority of us um, on this call are actually radiologists. Um, and maybe the reason we went into the radiology because we weren't good at dissecting. So if you did do your dissections, you may remember hopefully coming across the fascia of the head and neck. Now this fascia right here, which is the middle layer of the deep cervical fascia is referred to as the visceral fascia. Now, this was the original name given to it back in the 1930s. So this is the article by Gradinsky and Holyoke, and I would strongly, if you really like head and neck, go back and look at it. But they call this the visceral fascia. Now, the thing about head and neck that again makes it difficult is that we can take the same piece of anatomy and different, give it different names. So over time, the visceral, visceral fascia has acquired different names. Some people will call it the pharyngomucosal fascia, at the top, it transitions into the pharyngeal basilar fascia, uh, so on and so forth. But I still use the term visceral fascia. So if I use the term visceral fascia, what do I term the name of the space that's encompassed by the visceral fascia? Well, pure and simply, that's the visceral space. So how do you remember, without memorizing, what's in the visceral space? Well, it's actually pretty easy. You know, if you are with a group of people right now, or if you're by yourself and you're really bored, take up a mirror and open your mouth and say, ah. Well, if you do that, everything that you can see in the mucosa of your mouth, everything you can see in your mouth or in your throat, that is the visceral space. So the visceral space, pure and simply, is that space delineated by the visceral fascia. And basically, it's everything that you do when you look into your mouth. So that's how you can always remember the visceral space. So here's a patient right here that has a tumor that's involved in the visceral space. This is a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. If it was in a different part of the upper air digestive tract, it could be a squamous cell carcinoma involved in the oral cavity or the oropharynx, so on and so forth. But that's all in the visceral space. Now, one thing to remember about the visceral space is that um, the majority of these imaging findings are nonspecific. So here's a mass involving the visceral space. This happened to turn out to be an adenocarcinoma. Now there's absolutely no way that you can make this diagnosis just based on imaging findings. But the important thing to remember is that the purpose of imaging, especially when you're looking at a mass involving the visceral space, is not to give a, a differential diagnosis of 10 things. Rather, the referring physicians can see this mass, they can biopsy, and the pathologist can tell the diagnosis. Our job is to look for deep extent. 
So just remember when you're dealing with the visceral space mass, remember that the majority of physicians can see that lesion when they perform their endoscopy. Now, this is a quote unquote visceral space mass in a child. We can see that there's a lot of increased soft tissue involved in the visceral space. But remember, in this particular case, this is just normal adenoidal hypertrophy. And how can we be sure of this? We can be sure of it is that when we look at these deeper structures, so here's the tensor veli palatini, here's the levator veli palatini, excuse me, here's the tensor and here's the levator, apologies, and we can see there's no deep extension through the visceral fascia. So this is just benign um, adenoidal hypertrophy. And this is a lesion here, a submucosal lesion here below the visceral fascia. It's located in the pharyngeal bursa. It's high signal on T1, and this is the classic torn wall cyst. Again, this they may not be able to see on direct endoscopy because it is submucosal, um, and it's also quite commonly incidentally found on, um, on um, endoscopy. Or excuse me, I should say on brain MRs. So the next thing that we'll uh, talk about is to talk a little bit about uh, the next space. And this is pure and simply, what do you call the space that's located behind the pharynx? So the other name for the visceral face is, is the pharynx, because there's a nasopharynx, an oropharynx, and a hypopharynx. And pure and simply, that space that's located behind the pharynx is referred to as the retropharyngeal space. But if you look at the fascia that we talked about, there's one fascia right here, which I mentioned before, that's the visceral fascia. There's another fascia right here, which is the prevertebral fascia, which we'll talk to. And there's another fascia layer right here, this dashed line, which is referred to as the alar fascia. So the true retropharyngeal space is between the visceral space and the alar fascia. So this is the true retropharyngeal space. The space that's located between the alar fascia and the prevertebral fascia is referred to as the danger space. Now, look, I know we have a lot of things going on in our lives right now, and I know it's Friday, but on Saturday, if you can just remember that the space behind the pharynx is a retropharyngeal space, I'm going to be very, very happy. But for the aficionados here, just realize that this space is subdivided by the alar fascia into a true retropharyngeal space and the danger space. And this was just a patient that had trauma, and here we can see air in the retropharyngeal space. This is another example of a lesion involving the retropharyngeal space. Here we can see the carotid artery that wanders into the retropharyngeal space, and this is, if you will, the wandering carotid artery. Now, when we look in the retropharyngeal space, there's really not a lot of anatomy there. Basically, it's some fat, it's some fiber fatty tissue, but you do have these things in green right here, and these are the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, and there's a medial and a lateral group. So the normal retropharyngeal lymph nodes here, there's a medial and a lateral group of retropharyngeal lymph nodes, and this is a metastatic lymph node involving the retropharyngeal space. How do we know where it is? because here's the carotid artery and the retropharyngeal lymph node is located right there. Now, this is a patient, a child that has a sore throat and has swelling um, um, and uh, is really worried about an infection. Now, this is not a true retropharyngeal space abscess. What this is, is pus in the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. And this is what we refer to as separative adenitis. Now, this is a true retropharyngeal space abscess, and this abscess we can see crosses midline. Now, as I mentioned before, there's a retropharyngeal space and a danger space, and these spaces extend inferiorly into the mediastinum. The inferior aspect of the retropharyngeal space ends at approximately T2 to T6, and in this case, we can see this retropharyngeal space abscess extending into the mediastinum. So anytime you do see that fluid collection here involving the retropharyngeal space, make sure you extend your imaging into the mediastinum because this is all continuous. The danger space, which is in orange, extends all the way through the mediastinum and extends in through the core of the diaphragm and is continuous with the retroperitoneum. So the bottom line is, is that that space that's located behind the pharynx is the retropharyngeal space. So, so far we've covered the masticator space and what are the three things we want to remember? Muscle, bone, and nerve. 
Visceral space, whoops, sorry about that. Visceral space, what do we remember about the visceral space? Open your mouth and say, ah. Every time you can look in someone's mouth, you're actually in the visceral space. What's a retropharyngeal space? Well, the retropharyngeal space is really just that space behind the visceral space. Well, let's move now to the prevertebral space. Now, as mentioned before, there's this fascial layer right here, which is called the prevertebral fascia. That was the original name by Gradinsky and Holyoke and also used by um, uh, back, back in the days of Rouvier. But this has changed as well too. So now people now refer to this as the perivertebral space. So it depends, again, we take the same piece of anatomy and give it different names. This one's really, really easy because Every one of you that has looked at a spine MR, a cervical spine MR or a cervical spine CT has knows exactly what's in the prevertebral space. We don't call it the prevertebral space, but we call it the spine, right? But the bottom line is, is that you already know about this. So the most common prevertebral space masses are going to be what? Well, in this case, this is a, a, a um, retropharyngeal space abscess that extended uh, through C1, C2 and is causing a epidural abscess. This is a case of Potts disease here. Other causes of uh, prevertebral space masses, well, you can have disc herniations, you can have osteophytes, you can have any type of degenerative causes of masses that, that are prevertebral space masses. Again, we don't think about it as a head and neck space, but they are. Now, occasionally, there are certain head and neck lesions that arise in the prevertebral space. So here's a patient that has a large aggressive mass that's involving the very top of the prevertebral space, if you will, it's at the top of the notochord, and on T2, it's high signal. So I think everyone knows what this diagnosis is. This is gonna be a chordoma, and the reason why it's high signal on T2 but solid it contains those famous fissiliferous cells or fissiliferous cells. Don't ask me to spell it, um, but that's what those are the cells that combine it. And this is just another example here of a patient that has a mass involving the prevertebral space. No way you can get this. It's a plexiform neurofibroma, but I show it to highlight the mass involving the skull base here. So this is involving the prevertebral space. And here's an example right here of a, of a calcified lesion that's involving the prevertebral muscles. And this is an example of calcific tendinitis. So here's calcification of the longest coli muscles. The other term that I use for this is gout, if you will, involved in the neck. And it's probably not the right thing to say, but that's the way to think of it. It's deposition of calcium hydroxyapatite. Another prevertebral space mass, this mass right here, a patient with trauma, um, has a dissection involving the vertebral artery. Again, we don't think of this as a prevertebral space, but this is in our differential diagnosis of a prevertebral space mass. So when we think of the prevertebral space, we think of bone, we think of disc, we think of the vessels, and we think of some of those strange head neck lesions, and we always have to consider the chordoma. So the bottom line is, is any differential diagnosis that you have for a spine lesion, you can immediately map that to the prevertebral space. So if, you, if you've looked at a spine MR or looked at a spine CT, believe me, you got this one. So the next one is really hard. See how hard the, pre, the spaces of the head and neck are. If you really want to have something hard, go do mammography. I have no clue about mammography. But on the other hand, what's the next space? Well, what do you call the space of the head and neck that contains the parotid gland? Well, that's exactly right. You call it the parotid space. So basically, it's very, very easy. The space that contains the parotid gland is the parotid space. Now, the parotid space contains a very important nerve. And this nerve right here, which is seen here, is the parotid space. Now, I give credit, I think he may be on here, uh, Martin Ferraro from Argentina. Martin gave me this beautiful case of the Morphologic Institute. So Martin, if you're out there, thank you very much for letting me um, use this case. So the facial nerve right here separates the parotid gland into a superficial and deep lobe. Now, we can't always see the parotid gland, excuse me, the facial nerve, but we can have a pretty good approximation of where it's located because there is a vein right here that's located behind the mandible. And what do we call this vein that's located behind the mandible? Well, that's called the retromandibular vein. The facial nerve is located just lateral to the retromandibular vein. 
and this facial nerve, as you can beautifully see here, and also in this diagram here, this is kind of interesting. This diagram is not something I created from PowerPoint, but this is from Charles Bell, the person that Bell's palsy was named after in the article that he wrote in the 1800s. So this anatomy has been around for a long time. But the point of this is notice how the facial nerve provides this plane. So this plane separates the parotid gland into a superficial and a deep lobe. So when we think of the parotid gland, number one, the space that contains the parotid gland is the parotid space. The next thing we have to do is remember the facial nerve, and we can always find the facial nerve because it's just medial to the retromandibular vein, and that separates the parotid gland into a superficial and a deep lobe. Those are the three main concepts when we talk about the parotid space. So what are some differential diagnoses involving parotid space masses? So here's a mass, a patient that has bilateral masses involving the parotid space. Now these masses are bilateral, in this case, and sometimes these lesions can be multiple and to involve the same parotid gland. Now, if the patient had no history of lymphoma or had no history of metastases, then the most likely diagnosis starts with a W, and that's the Warthin's tumors. Now, why do Warthin's tumors arise in the parotid gland? Because the other name for Warthin's tumors is called cyst adenoma lymphomatosum. So basically, the parotid glands contains multiple lymph nodes. They're located in the pretragal region, below the capsule, around the facial nerve, and in the tail. And this lymphoid tissue is where Warthin's tumors arise from. So that's why Warthin's tumors can be bilateral and they can be midline. This was a patient that has multiple cystic lesions involving the parotid gland. If I told you this patient was HIV positive, well, this is the classic lymphoepithelial cyst that can involve the parotid gland. Now, here's a patient that has this lesion that's involving the parotid gland. It's involving the deep lobe and extending deeply into the space that we'll soon talk about, which is the space next to the pharynx, and that's the parapharyngeal space. This lesion is solid, but also has high T2 signal. Now, this is not a chordoma, but in a way, these signal characteristics in a way mimic a chordoma, although they're histologically distinct, but this is a pleomorphic adenoma. So pleomorphic adenomas are solid lesions, they enhance, but on T2, the classic appearance is its high signal. They can occasionally have heterogeneous signal as well too, but when you see this, it's a pleomorphic adenoma. And this is another pleomorphic adenoma here. So this one's just involving the superficial lobe, whereas this lesion is involving the deep lobe. So the key concepts here, parotid space mass, it's involving the deep lobe, it's extending into the parapharyngeal space, and this type of imaging appearance, you can uh, uh, make a pretty good diagnosis with a high degree of confidence that this is a pleomorphic adenoma. This is an example of the importance of understanding the facial nerve in the parotid gland. So this is a patient that has an adenoid cystic carcinoma, a aggressive malignancy involving the parotid gland. And remember, these tumors can jump along the facial nerve and this is an example right here of retrograde perineural spread along the facial nerve involving the descending portion of the right facial nerve. So again, the importance of the parotid gland, what are those key pieces of anatomy? Again, you don't have to uh, memorize everything, just remember those key pieces of anatomy. So parotid gland is number one. What's the nerve? The facial nerve. How do we find the facial nerve? It's next to the retromandibular vein. The facial nerve divides the parotid gland into a superficial and a deep lobe. And remember, you can always have the potential for retrograde perineural spread. So if you just remember those four or five concepts about the parotid gland, that's gonna allow you to evaluate and, uh, and, and really understand how to better interpret lesions involved in the parotid space. Well, the next space is really pretty easy. Again, all of this is pretty easy. Let's do a little review. So what do we call the space here that contains the masticator space? That was, uh, the muscles of mastication, that's the masticator space. What do we call the space here that you say, ah, you look into, that's the visceral space. What do we call the space behind the pharynx? Well, that is the retropharyngeal space. What do we call the space that contains the spine? Very easy, right? The prevertebral space. And what do we call the space that contains the parotid gland? Well, that's just pure and simply the parotid space. Now I'm gonna make it really hard now. Ready? 
What do you call the space that's next to the pharynx? Well, pure and simply, that's just the parapharyngeal space. Head and neck really is that easy. And it's that easy if you understand the anatomy. So here's an example of a mass involving the parapharyngeal space. So how do we know it's involving the parapharyngeal space? Notice how the carotid artery is displaced posteriorly, and notice how the medial, the medial pterygoid is displaced anteriorly. This tells you that this is arising in a location that is pushing this muscle up, but is displacing the carotid artery more posteriorly. So this is a mass involving that parapharyngeal space, and this is a pleomorphic adenoma. The most common lesion to arise in the parapharyngeal space, to originate in the parapharyngeal space, is a pleomorphic adenoma. Now, here's a mass that's involving the parapharyngeal space. So if we look at the normal parapharyngeal space on the right-hand side, we can see the typical triangular fat pad here involving the par parapharyngeal space. But notice on the left-hand side, the parapharyngeal space is kind of squashed, it's compressed. And this is a tumor involving the tonsil that is extending into the parapharyngeal space. So the most common lesion to extend into the parapharyngeal space, the most common tumor to extend into the parapharyngeal space is deep spread of a squamous cell carcinoma. So it's important to differentiate the most common tumor to arise in the parapharyngeal space, which is pleomorphic adenoma, from the most common tumor to extend into the parapharyngeal space, which is deep spread of squamous cell carcinoma. All right. Hopefully everybody's with me so far. Um, the next space, Again, it's really, really easy. What do you call the space that contains the carotid artery? Well, that is pure and simply the carotid space. And again, it all boils down to anatomy. So when we talk about the carotid space, this was the, the term, again, that was used before with Grudinsky and Holyoke back in the 1930s. And I think the term has, uh, um, has been able to weather the test of time. But there's another name for the carotid space. There's something called the carotid sheath. And if you're dealing with the ENT surgeons, the carotid space is also known as the post-styloid parapharyngeal space. So let me try to explain this anatomy to you. I mentioned earlier that the space next to the pharynx is called the parapharyngeal space. And if we're a radiologist, we call this space the carotid space. But if you're an ENT surgeon, sometimes they will refer to this space that we call the parapharyngeal space as the pre-styloid parapharyngeal space because it's anterior to the styloid process and the space posterior to the styloid process as the post-styloid parapharyngeal space. So remember what I was telling you is that we take the same piece of anatomy and we give it different names. But the nice thing now is I think there is a growing consensus that we will call this space the parapharyngeal space and this space the carotid space. Now, what are the components of the carotid space? You know this already. You already know it. And that's the carotid artery, the jugular vein. You've got some nerves here, which are cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and, and 12 in the upper part of it. You also have lymph nodes, and then you have this lesion right here, which is a sympathetic chain but the majority of pathology is going to be involving this. Now, just step back for a second. Now, all of a sudden, I can see everyone getting nervous. It's head and neck. I'm like, how am I going to memorize this? I'm going to tell you, don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it, because any time that you have this normal anatomy of an artery, a vein, a nerve, or a lymph node anywhere in your body, you can take that same differential diagnosis and just map it directly into the head and neck. So let's see how this works because it's really not that bad. So everyone knows this, big, large, enhancing, dilated mass involving the left carotid space. Well, this is an aneurysm. You get aneurysms everywhere. You get aneurysms in your chest, you can get it in your abdomen, you get anywhere in your body. So you know that, right? But that's a carotid space mass. What if I told you this patient had a prior history of a um, central venous catheter. Well, this is jugular vein thrombosis. Why? There's a jugular vein, there's a carotid artery, there's a carotid artery, there's a jugular vein. Again, very, very simple stuff. Another example of a carotid space mass, this patient ended up having trauma. 
Here we can see the, a narrowed lumen and it's surrounded by this eccentric area of increased T1 signal. And that is just a dissection involving the left carotid artery. Another, now, another example here. Now here's a mass, and I'm gonna, gonna trick you on this because I bet I know what everyone's gonna say. Here's a mass that's involving the carotid space, but be careful here, okay? This is um, intermediate signal on T1, and look at T2, it's very, very homogeneous. And when we do an MRA, we can see there's no flow at all. The diagnosis here is a schwannoma. And the key thing here is that if you see these masses involving the carotid space, and they're at least 2.5 centimeters in size, and you don't, do not see flow voids, and that's a pretty um, accurate or definitive or confident way to say that these are not hypervascular lesions like a glomus tumor, but this in fact is a schwannoma involving the carotid space. This on the other hand is your classic case of a paraganglioma or, oops, sorry about that. Oh, let me go back there. Um, hold on, don't look, there we go. Um, here's another example here of a, a patient that has a mass involving the, carot the carotid space. Now, how do we know it's in carotid space? Look at the carotid artery, it's being displaced anteriorly. If the carotid artery was being displaced posteriorly, then this would place it in the peripharyngeal space. So this is a hypervascular lesion arising in the carotid space, and this is a glomus tumor, and this is the correlative angiogram telling us that's what it is. Now, what types of glomus tumors arise in the head and neck? Well, there's actually four types. This glomus tumor is arising from the crotch of the internal and the external carotid artery. And notice how the external carotid artery is displaced laterally and the internal carotid artery is displaced laterally. So this is a true carotid body tumor. If the internal and the carotid arteries were pushed together, then this would be a glomus vagali tumor. If this lesion was arising right here at the skull base, in the jugular frame, and then that would be a glomus jugulari, and if this was arising in the middle ear cavity, then it would be a glomus tympanicum. So remember, carotid body tumors displace the internal and the external carotid arteries. The glomus vagali tumors push them together. If it arises at the skull base, then that's a glomus jugulari. And if it arises in the middle ear cavity, it's a glomus tympanicum. Well, the last couple of things that I'll talk about in the last two spaces, again, are very, very simple. Look what we've done so far. We've gone from masticator space to visceral space to retropharyngeal space to prevertebral space to parotid space, parapharyngeal space, carotid space. And I bet all of you can remember this. The next space, it's very simple. Again, very, very simple. But you have to learn a little bit about the classics and you have to little, learn a little bit about the Greek and Latin roots of words. So the Greek root of tongue is glosses, and the Latin root of tongue is lingua. So when we talk about the next space, if we can remember that the sublingual space and lingua is Latin, then we'll remember that the sublingual space is that space that's below the tongue. So remember that friend you make, or in case you're bored if you want to, very simple, how do we remember where the sublingual space is? Well, you just take your finger, and I'm going to demonstrate. Take your finger, work with me here, okay? Open your mouth, the guy of hung, so that's now recorded. So if you ever forget where the sublingual space was, literally open your mouth, stick out your tongue, and then just go ahead and stick your finger below your tongue, and you'll always be able to figure out exactly where that sublingual space is. Now, what's the anatomy of the sublingual space? Well, the lateral margin of this is formed by the ramus of the mandible. The wall of the sublingual space is formed by the mylohyoid muscle, as is seen here. And then the floor of this is formed by the hyoid bone. So in this anatomic image again, there is the mandible. Here is the mylohyoid muscle. Here is the hyoid bone. And you can see on the opposite side, there's another mylohyoid muscle and there's a mandible there. So the way I think of this, it's like a teacup. So basically, anytime that you can pour tea into a teacup, everything that's in that teacup is in the sublingual space. So for me, the rim of this is the mandible. This part here is a mylohyoid muscle and the floor is the hyoid bone. So everything within that teacup is in the sublingual space. 
So here's a schematic illustration of a mass involving the floor of the mouth. Here we can see a tumor here. This is a classical example of a squamous cell carcinoma. And maybe one day later we can uh, talk about uh, imaging findings of squamous cell carcinomas of the oral cavity and the oral pharynx. We don't have time to do it today, but that's really in a lecture un unto itself. But the most common tumor to involve the sublingual space is a squamous cell carcinoma of the floor of the mouth. Now, here's an example of a tumor that's in, uh, a lesion involving the sublingual space. And we can see this mass right here. We can see it's fluid. It could be a lot of things, but if I tell you the patient had a fever, you can go back and you can look at the bone right here. We can see that bone is very, very sclerotic. And if you have a really, really sharp eye, you can see this lesion right here around the tooth, this little lucency right here. And this is the rotten tooth. This is a little periapical abscess that uh, has resulted in this chronic osteomyelitis <clears throat> that has now resulted in a floor of mouth abscess. Now, what about some of the cystic lesions that are involved in the floor of the mouth? Here we have an anterior midline cystic lesion. That's again, important thing, it's midline and it's involved in the floor of the mouth. So this is an epidermoid. Now, I'm gonna break a little bit from here because I wanna point out the name of this muscle. This muscle goes from the genial tubercle to the tongue base. See the transverse fibers of the tongue base? And there is the muscle right here. Well, that muscle is the genioglossus muscle. So remember, sublingual is Latin for tongue. Glossus is Greek for tongue. So when we talk about the spaces, we use the Latin root and its sublingual space. When we talk about the muscles, like the genioglossus muscle or the hyoglossus muscle, then then we use the Greek root. So that's where the confusion comes in. Now, sorry about my pointer here. It's, it's a, for some reason, it goes transversely. But you can see the cystic mass that's located right here. And that cystic mass is a, mid, a pyramid-line mass that is continuous in this particular case with this gland right here. And what do we call the gland in the sublingual space? That's right, it's pure and simply the sublingual gland. So this is a congenital obstruction and a little bit of a dilatation involving the sublingual gland. And we all know the name of this. So you have to remember a frog. And if you remember the frog, you'll always be able to remember that this is a ranula involving the sublingual space. Another example of a ranula, ranulas can be bilateral, as is seen here. What muscle is this? Goes from the genial tubercle to, you can see very nicely, the tongue base. So this is the genioglossus muscle. Here, um, we can see that the ranula right here is above the mylohyoid muscle. So this type of ranula that's located above the mylohyoid muscle, it's contained in the sublingual space, is referred to as a simple ranula. Now, if this ranula extended deeply through the mylohyoid muscle into the next space that we talk about, again, it's the same piece of anatomy. It has three different names. So the ranula that extends below the mylohyoid muscle, if it's not simple, it's complex. It can dive through the um, uh, mylohyoid muscle, or it can also plunge through the mylohyoid muscle. So complex diving or plunging, all of these names have been given to the ranula. And unfortunately, that's what makes head and neck hard. It makes it hard because we take the same piece of anatomy and we just give it different names. So apologies for that. But once you understand the concepts, it's pretty, pretty easy. And what's the last uh, space? What's the last uh, space that we're going to talk about? Well, this last space is that space that's below the mandible. And pure and simply, what do you call the space that's below the mandible? So here's our mandible here on these, this beautiful anatomic image. Here's our mylohyoid muscle here. Here's our mylohyoid muscle here. Everything above this is in the sublingual space and everything below this is in the submandibular space. So pure and simply, the space that's located behind, below the mandible is a submandibular space. By the way, what's the name of the space up here, right? Easy, right? Even this muscle right here, this is all masticator space. There's your masseter muscle. There's your um, uh, temporalis muscle. Here's your uh, lateral pterygoid muscle. Here's, excuse me, here's your, yeah, lateral pterygoid muscle. And here's your medial pterygoid muscle. Again, it's all about anatomy. 
So the space below your mandible is the submandibular space. Now, how will you always remember the submandibular space? Now, I think my wife was earlier on the call, but she signed off right now, so I can say this and not get in trouble. So if you have a dog, a cat, or a spouse like this, I do this to my wife all the time. Actually, she'll hit me if I ever did this to her. But if you literally tick your chin, if you have a dog or a cat, don't they love to be petted like this under their chin? You should try to do that. If you're especially brave, do it to your spouse. You have a lot of time together, so you know why not make the best use of it? But if you do something like this, that is you've been palpating your dog, your cat, or spouse's submandibular space for the last you know how many years you've had that uh, creature, right? So you can always remember the submandibular space. So what are the components of the submandibular space? Well, the most common component, the most numerous component are these lymph nodes. And these are the level one lymph nodes that are located in the submandibular space. And so again, uh, we don't have talk to get into lymph nodes. Maybe one day I'll get invited back when we talk about head and neck lymph nodes. But these are all level one lymph nodes that are located in the submandibular space. Again, the most numerous component of the submandibular space. So here's an example. If you're in a busy private practice, this is one of the most common reasons you'll be doing head and neck imaging. Here we have dilatation of the left submandibular gland. We can see this lesion here. With a leap of faith here, we can see this dilatation of the duct. And the reason that duct is dilated is because of this little stone right here. So this is a sialolith involving the sublingual space, but because the duct of the submandibular gland runs in the sublingual space and enters at the frenulum, this is causing an obstructive sialadenitis involving the left submandibular gland. Another example here, this is dilatation of the left submandibular gland. It's not a lymph node, it's dilatation of the left submandibular gland. And if you draw a line down the middle here, we can see fat here on the right side, but very subtly notice how all that fat is gone on the left side. So this obstruction of the submandibular gland was due to a very, very subtle squamous cell carcinoma here that was causing an obstructive sialadenitis. So it's a little bit of an older case, but again, makes a very, very important point. If you see obstruction of this gland, make sure you look for the stone, but very carefully scrutinize the fat in the sublingual space to see if there's a subtle little squamous cell carcinoma. And finally, the last case that we'll talk about is this. So I think we all know the diagnosis here. We have a paramidline cystic lesion involving the sublingual space. If we look in the submandibular space, we can see this ranula has now uh, dived or plunged, however you want to say it, into the submandibular space. And really, if you look very closely, it has a little small little brother here on the left-hand side. So this is a plunging ranula that extended in the sublingual space into the submandibular space. The reason that's important is that if you, the radiologist, say that the ranula is located in the sublingual space only, then the surgeons can marsupialize this through an intraoral approach. But if you, the radiologist, say that this ranula has extended below the submandibular space, then the type of surgery that will need to be performed would have to be not only an intraoral, but a cervical approach. So again, that's the real value added of radiology. So I think I'm on time. We'll have about 10 minutes for questions, but what I wanted to do is to, again, review and tell you a way, hopefully, that you don't have to memorize anything and just kind of take a holistic approach and just remember how we can remember some of these key concepts. So number one, the masticator space, it's the muscles of mastication. What are they? They're muscle, there's bone, and there's nerve. That will give you your masticator space mass differential diagnosis. What about the visceral space? The visceral space is open your mouth and say, ah, everything that you can see in the mouth is in the visceral space. The retropharyngeal space is that space behind the pharynx. Very simply, the retropharyngeal space. The prevertebral space is just the spine. The parotid space is what contains the parotid gland. The parapharyngeal space is next to the pharynx. The carotid space just contains the carotid gland. The sublingual space, ah, below your tongue, and the submandibular space is right under your chin. So with that, I just want to thank all of you. I think we had up to 1,200 um, uh, attendees today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for taking
time to attend. It means so much to me. And um, thank you for allowing me um, to, for us all, if you will, to be alone, but be together. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. McCurgy. Uh, do you have a couple minutes for some Q&As? Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Do you want to go ahead and open the Q&A section and answer the ones you see fit? Uh, yeah, sure. Let me go ahead and do this. Uh, so um, here's one for you, um, Ashley. Someone uh, emailed me and said, how can I access the larynx lecture that we gave last time? So do you, can you answer that one for me? Yeah, I'll uh, send them a message. Fantastic. OK. Um, someone um, asked a question about um, how can you delineate the fascia, fascia on the C, uh, CT? That's a great question. You really can't see the fascia in most instances you just can't see it so a lot of it is knowing where to expect to see the fascia so um you really can't see it but that's why if you do know where the back of the pharynx is um if you do know where the back of the pharynx is and you'll be able to identify the expected location of the visceral fascia if you know where the anterior margin of the spine is you'll be able to delineate the anterior margin of the um pre-vertebral space. So you really can't see it on CT, but it's good to know um, if you understand your anatomy, you should be able to approximate the location. Okay, um, someone said here, what's the demarcation between the danger space and the paravertebral space? Again, they use the term paravertebral space, uh, perivertebral space, or prevertebral space. It's all the same. So the demarcation in the paravertebral space is going to be the prevertebral fascia. So the prevertebral fascia, so you have the danger space and behind it, you have um, the prevertebral fascia and then behind that you have the prevertebral space. Um, the next one is a normal cutoff of the prevertebral space at all cervical levels. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, maybe it's the regular thickness. Um, I would say it's about, if I remember back from my residency, I don't look at plain films that often. I would think it's uh, maybe four or five millimeters, but I would have to defer to the um, pediatric textbooks for that. Um, how to locate the palatine tonsils easy, easily. So I think I can answer that one. Let me see if I can close this up and uh, I can break from the script here and I can show you very easily the palatine tonsils. Uh, let me go back. Uh, right, so here's an example here. This was that case I showed of the uh, wandering carotid artery. These guys right here are the palatine tonsils. So the palatine tonsils are located here lateral to the level of the oropharynx. So the palatine tonsils are here. In fact, the reason they did the surgery on this patient is that they wanted to do a tonsillectomy. But when the surgeons looked down into the back of the pharynx, they saw something pulsating. So the reason they got the CT in this case was to see whether or not there was a wandering carotid artery, because that would be important here uh, when they were doing their tonsillectomy. Well, I have 70 questions here. Thank you for your questions. Um, let's see. Um, uh, how to differentiate intramural hematoma and dissection on MR? That's a really good question. Um, the only way I can say that, um, uh, the, the dissection obviously is going to slowly um, efface the carotid artery immediately. I don't know if we can really differentiate a true intramural hematoma from a dissection. I think, um, I think if we can differentiate clot, if we can differentiate intraluminal clot, because then you can actually see the clot and a regular margin of the lumen um, flow void from the uh, intraluminal clot. But as far as intramural hematoma and dissection, I don't, at least I can't differentiate between those two. Uh, the next one is, is there a cutoff point uh, to be sure that the parotid space lesion is malignant or benign? So that is an excellent question. Um, we overall, if you're trying to separate a benign versus malignant lesion, if you just see a distinct lesion that's maybe two centimeters or something like that, the size criteria doesn't help. 
But what can help is the following, is that sometimes we will see, oftentimes are on a brain MR, we will actually see little lesions, rounded lesions in the parotid gland. They're somewhere between seven, eight, or nine millimeters. They're solid and they're bright on T2. And so you're not sure whether it's a very, very early pleomorphic adenoma or whether it's a Worthen's tumor or whether it's a lymph node. In general, what we do is that we use 10 millimeters. So if I see a lesion, especially in, a, in an asymptomatic patient, incidentally on a brain MR, and I see a lesion that's less than 10 millimeters, then I will just ascribe that to an intraparotid lymph node. If I see something that's 10 millimeters or 11 millimeters or 15 millimeters, then I would recommend build, bringing the, the patient back for further imaging. So for me, that 10 millimeters is the cutoff between a um, lymph node and a primary uh, interparotid uh, lesion. Um, another question here, level two, three, four, in, uh, which compartment are they in? So the level two, three, and four lymph nodes are in the carotid space. Um, the carotid space is also the post-styloid peripharyngeal space. So the levels two, three, and four are in what I refer to as the carotid space, but if you use the term post-styloid peripharyngeal space, that's exactly right. So another one asked one of my favorite questions, and I'm so glad they're asked, they asked it. Is the floor of the mouth the same as the sublingual space? And the answer is yes, 100%. Because if I was giving a talk, and maybe I'll give this one day, if the, you guys will allow me, if I give a talk on the oral cavity and the oral pharynx, then I will refer to the sublingual space as the floor of the mouth. But because I'm giving a talk on the spaces, then I will call this the sublingual space. Uh, can you demonstrate the mylohyoid muscle on CT? Yes, you can. Uh, let me see if I can um, get a CT scan. Let's see. Uh, I think I know where that's located. Give me a second. There we go. So for the person that asked that question, so here's the mandible here. This is the mylohyoid muscle here. This is the mylohyoid muscle here. This is the hyoglossus muscle. So the mylohyoid muscle is just deep to the ramus and the mandible and directly attaches to the inferior, uh, the, the cortex of the uh, lingual cortex of the mandible. Um, I think we got, I have two more minutes left. Is that right, Ashley? Yes, sir, two more minutes. Sure. What other cystic masses do you think about in the midline and sublingual space? It's a great question. So here's the scoop is that midline cystic mass is involved in the floral mouth. Uh, if it's anterior and midline, it's an epidermoid. If the cystic mass is located in the tongue base and it's midline, then that is located in the thyroid, that is a thyroglossal duct cyst. Because the thyroglossal duct cyst arises in the foramen cecum, which is located in the tongue base. Okay. Here's a question. Someone asked me, what's my favorite space? What's my favorite space? Typically it's a bar, so, uh, but that's not part of the lecture. So sorry about that. Um, someone asked uh, the infratemporal space versus the masticator space. That's a great question. So the masticator space has essentially replaced the term infratemporal fossa. So one of my jobs, I mentioned this in the last lecture, is I was a radiology representative for the staging criteria for the AJCC we replace the term infratemporal fossa with masticator space. So the infratemporal fossa is essentially the same thing as the masticator space. Um, and here is a, another great question here. It says, can you please repeat carotid vessel displacement on the basis of the mass? So I think that's a fantastic question. Let me stop there, Ashley, because I know we're gonna run out of time and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, yeah. What I'm going to do here is that here's the, uh, here's the carotid artery that's located here. If the carotid artery is displaced anteriorly, the majority of the times the lesion is going to be arising from the carotid space. If the carotid artery is displaced medially, the majority of the times the lesion is going to be arising from the parotid space. If the carotid artery is displaced posteriorly, then it's going to be arising from the peripharyngeal space.
And if this carotid artery is displaced medially, uh, excuse me, if the carotid artery is displaced laterally, then it's going to be arising either from the prevertebral space um, or potentially the retropharyngeal space. So you have the four ways to do it, and I'll do one more time. Superiorly displacement is from the carotid space. Inferior displacement is from the parapharyngeal space. Lateral displacement is going to be a retropharyngeal space or prevertebral space, or the medial displacement is going to be from the parotid space. So I probably should stop there. Um, again, thank you very much for everyone. If, um, I'm getting all sorts of WhatsApps and uh, WeChats, and so it's I, I, for me, it means so much for you that you take your time. I know everyone's on different time zones, but uh, thank you very much. I'll turn it over to you, Ashley. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. McCurdy, and sorry if we did not get to your questions today. Um, thank you also to all of you for participating in this noon conference. So there's been many questions about how to access this and other noon conferences. They are made on demand on mrionline.com. There is also, you can also sign up for future noon conferences there. Um, on Monday, April 6th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Dr. Daniel Ortiz will be joining us on the topic of managing COVID-19 in a low resource endemic hospital, how we do it. Please check on social media and online and uh, register for our future noon conferences. Thank you so much and have a great day.